सिद्धार्थ बाय हारमन हेस पार्ट टू चैप्टर एट गोविंदा गोविंदा वन स्पेंट अ रेस्ट पीरियड विद सम अदर मंग्स इन द प्लेजर ग्रोव विच कमला द कोटिजान हैड वंस प्रेजेंटेड टू द फॉलोअर्स ऑफ गौतम ही हर्ड टॉक ऑफ एन ओल्ड फेरी मैन हु लिव्ड बाय द रिवर अ डेज जर्नी अवे एंड हु मैनी कंसिडर्ड टू बी अ सेज When Govinda moved on he chose the path to the ferry eager to see this ferryman for although he had lived his life according to the rule and was also regarded with respect by the younger monks for his age and modesty there was still restlessness in his heart and his seeking was unsatisfied he arrived at the river and asked the old man to take him across when they climbed out of the boat on the other side he said to the old man You show much kindness to the monks and pilgrims you have taken many of us across are you not also a seeker of the right path there was a smile in siddhartha's old eyes as he said do you call yourself a seeker o venerable one you who are already advanced in years and wear the robe of gautama's monks i am indeed old said govinda but i have never ceased seeking I will never cease seeking. That seems to be my destiny. It seems to me that you also have sought. Will you talk to me a little about it, my friend? Siddhartha said, "What could I say to you that would be of value except that perhaps you seek too much, that as a result of your seeking you cannot find?" "How is that?" asked Govinda. When someone is seeking said Siddhartha it happens quite easily that he only sees the thing that he is seeking that he is unable to find anything unable to absorb anything because he is only thinking of the thing he is seeking because he has a goal because he is obsessed with his goal seeking means to have a goal but finding means to be free to be receptive to have no goal You O worthy one are perhaps indeed a seeker for in striving towards your goal you do not see many things that are under your nose I do not quite understand said Govinda how do you mean Siddhartha said once O worthy one many years ago you came to this river and found a man sleeping there you sat beside him to guard him while he slept but you did not recognize the sleeping man Govinda Astonished and like one bewitched the monk gazed at the ferryman are you siddhartha he asked in a timid voice i did not recognize you this time too i am very pleased to see you again siddhartha very pleased you have changed very much my friend and have you become a ferryman now siddhartha laughed warmly yes i have become a ferryman many people have to change a great deal and wear all sorts of clothes I am one of those my friend you are very welcome govinda and i invite you to stay the night in my hut govinda stayed the night in the hut and slept in the bed that had once been vasudeva's he asked the friend of his youth many questions and siddhartha had a great deal to tell him about his life when it was time for govinda to depart the following morning he said with some hesitation Before I go on my way Siddhartha I should like to ask you one more question Have you a doctrine belief or knowledge which you uphold which helps you to live and do right Siddhartha said you know my friend that even as a young man when we lived with the ascetics in the forest I came to distrust doctrines and teachers and to turn my back on them I am still of the same turn of mind although I have since that time had many teachers A beautiful courtesan was my teacher for a long time and a rich merchant and a dice player. On one occasion one of the Buddha's wandering monks was my teacher. He halted in his pilgrimage to sit beside me when I fell asleep in the forest. I also learned something from him and I am grateful to him, very grateful, but most of all I have learned from this river and from my predecessor Vasudeva. He was a simple man. He was not a thinker, but he realized the essential as well as Gautama. He was a holy man, a saint. Govinda said, "It seems to me, Siddhartha, that you still like to jest a little. 
I believe you and know that you have not followed any teacher, but have you not yourself, if not a doctrine, certain thoughts? Have you not discovered a certain knowledge yourself that has helped you to leave? It would give me great pleasure if you would tell me something about this. Siddhartha said, Yes, I have had thoughts and knowledge here and there. Sometimes for an hour or for a day I have become aware of knowledge, just as one feels life in one's heart. I have had many thoughts, but it would be difficult for me to tell you about them. But this is one thought that has impressed me. Govinda, wisdom is not communicable. The wisdom which a wise man tries to communicate always sounds foolish. Are you jesting? asked Govinda. No, I am telling you what I have discovered. Knowledge can be communicated but not wisdom. One can find it, be fortified by it, do wonders through it, but one cannot communicate and teach it. I suspected this when I was still a youth and it was this that drove me away from teachers. There is one thought I have had, Govinda, which you will again think is a jest or folly. That is, in every truth, the opposite is equally true. For example, a truth can only be expressed and enveloped in words if it is one-sided. Everything that is thought and expressed in words is one-sided, only half the truth. It all lacks totality, completeness, unity. When the illustrious Buddha taught about the world, he had to divide it into samsara and nirvana, into illusion and truth, into suffering and salvation. One cannot do otherwise. There is no other method for those who teach. But the world itself being in and around us is never one-sided. Never is a man or a did holy samsara or holy nirvana. Never is a man holy, a saint or a sinner. This only seems so because we suffer the illusion that time is something real. Time is not real, Govinda. I have realized this repeatedly. And if time is not real, then the dividing line that seems to lie between this world and eternity, between suffering and bliss, between good and evil, is also an illusion. How is that? asked Govinda, puzzled. Listen, my friend, I am a sinner. And you are a sinner, but some day the sinner will be Brahman again, will some day attain Nirvana, will some day become a Buddha. Now this some day is illusion, it is only a comparison. The sinner is not on the way to a Buddha like state, he is not evolving, although our thinking cannot conceive things otherwise. No, the potential Buddha already exists in the sinner, his future is already there. The potential hidden Buddha must be recognized in him, in you, in everybody. The world, Govinda, is not imperfect or slowly evolving along a long path to perfection. No, it is perfect at every moment. Every sin already carries grace within it. All small children are potential old men. All sucklings have death within them. All dying people, eternal life. It is not possible for one person to see how far another is on the way. The Buddha exists in the robber and dice player. The robber exists in the Brahman. During deep meditation it is possible to dispel time, to see simultaneously all the past, present and future, and then everything is good, everything is perfect, everything is Brahman. Therefore it seems to me that everything that exists is good, death as well as life, sin as well as holiness, wisdom as well as folly. Everything is necessary. Everything needs only my agreement, my assent, my loving understanding. Then all is well with me and nothing can harm me. I learned through my body and soul that it was necessary for me to sin, that I needed lust, that I had to strive for property and experience nausea and the depths of despair in order to learn not to resist them, in order to learn to love the world and no longer compare it with some kind of desired imaginary world, some imaginary vision of perfection, but to leave it as it is, to love it and be glad to belong to it. These, Govinda, are some of the thoughts that are in my mind. Siddhartha bent down, lifted a stone from the ground and held it in his hand. 
This, he said, handling it, is a stone and within a certain length of time it will perhaps be soil and from the soil it will become plant, animal or man. Previously I should have said, this stone is just a stone, it has no value, it belongs to the world of Maya, but perhaps because within the cycle of change it can also become man and spirit, it is also of importance. That is what I should have thought, but now I think this stone is stone, it is also animal, God and Buddha. I do not respect and love it because it was one thing and will become something else, but because it has already long been everything and always is everything. I love it just because it is a stone, because today and now it appears to me a stone. I see value and meaning in each one of its fine markings and cavities, in the yellow, in the grey, in the hardness, and the sound of it when I knock it, in the dryness or dampness of its surface. There are stones that feel like oil or soap, that look like leaves or sand, and each one is different, and worships own in its own way. Each one is Brahman. At the same time, it is very much stone, oily or soapy, and that is just what pleases me and seems wonderful and worthy of worship. But I will say no more about it. Words do not express thoughts very well. They always become a little different immediately they are expressed, a little distorted, a little foolish, and yet it also pleases me and seems right that what is of value and wisdom to one man seems nonsense to another. Govinda had listened in silence. Why did you tell me about the stone? he asked hesitatingly after a pause. I did so unintentionally. But perhaps it illustrates that I just love the stone and the river and all these things that we see and from which we can learn. I can love a stone, Govinda, and a tree or a piece of bark. These are things and one can love things, but one cannot love words. Therefore teachings are of no use to me. They have no hardness, no softness, no colors, no comers, no smell, no taste. They have nothing but words. Perhaps that is what prevents you from finding peace. Perhaps there are too many words for even salvation and virtue. Samsara and Nirvana are only two words, Govinda. Nirvana is not a thing. There is only the word Nirvana. Govinda said, Nirvana is not only a word, my friend, it is a thought. Siddhartha continued, It may be a thought, but I must confess, my friend, that I do not differentiate very much between thoughts and words. Quite frankly, I do not attach great importance to thoughts either. I attach more importance to things. For example, there was a man at this ferry who was my predecessor and teacher. He was a holy man who for many years believed only in the river and nothing else. He noticed that the river's voice spoke to him. He learned from it. It educated and taught him. The river seemed like a god to him, and for many years he did not know that every wind, every cloud, every bird, every bittle is equally divine and knows and can teach just as well as the esteemed river. But when this holy man went off into the woods, he knew everything. He knew more than you and I, without teachers, without books, just because he believed in the river. Govinda said, but what you call thing, is it something real, something intrinsic? Is it not only the illusion of Maya, only image and appearance? Your stone, your tree, are they real? This also does not trouble me much, said Siddhartha. If they are illusion, then I also am illusion. And so they are always of the same nature as myself. It is that which makes them so lovable and venerable. That is why I can love them. And here is a doctrine at which you will laugh, it seems to me, Govinda, that love is the most important thing in the world. It may be important to great thinkers to examine the world, to examine and despise it. But I think it is only important to love the world, not to despise it, not for us to hate each other, but to be able to regard the world and ourselves and all beings with love, admiration and respect. I understand that, said Govinda, but that is just what the illustrious one called illusion. He preached benevolence, forbearance, sympathy, patience, but not love. He forbade us to bind ourselves to earthly love. 
I know that, said Siddhartha, smiling radiantly. I know that, Govinda. And here we find ourselves within the maze of meanings, within the conflict of words. For I will not deny that my words about love are in apparent contradiction to the teachings of Gautama. That is just why I distrust words so much. For I know that this contradiction is an illusion. I know that I am at one with Gautama. How indeed could he not know love? He who has recognized all humanity's vanity and transitoriness, yet loves humanity so much that he has devoted a long life solely to help and teach people. Also with this great teacher, the thing to me is of greater importance than the words. His deeds and life are more important to me than his opinions. Not in speech or thought do I regard him as a great man, but in his deeds and life. The two old men were silent for a long time. Then as Govinda was preparing to go, he said, I thank you, Siddhartha, for telling me something of your thoughts. Some of them are strange thoughts. I cannot grasp them all immediately. However, I thank you and I wish you many peaceful days. Inwardly, however, he thought, Siddhartha is a strange man, and he expresses strange thoughts. His ideas seem crazy. How different do the illustrious one's doctrines sound? They are clear, straightforward, comprehensible. They contain nothing strange, wild, or laughable. But Siddhartha's hands and feet, his eyes, his brow, his breathing, his smile, his greeting, his gait affect me differently from his thoughts. Never since the time our illustrious Gautama passed into Nirvana. Have I ever met a man with the exception of Siddhartha about whom I felt this is a holy man. His ideas may be strange, his words may sound foolish, but his glance and his hand, his skin and his hair all radiate a purity, peace, serenity, gentleness and saintliness which I have never seen in any man since the recent death of our illustrious teacher. While Govinda was thinking these thoughts and there was conflict in his heart, he again bowed to Siddhartha, full of affection towards him. He bowed low before the quietly seated man. Siddhartha, he said, we are now old men. We may never see each other again in this life. I can see, my dear friend, that you have found peace. I realize that I have not found it. Tell me one more word, my esteemed friend. Tell me something that I can conceive, something I can understand. Give me something to help me on my way, Siddhartha. My path is often hard and dark. Siddhartha was silent and looked at him with his calm, peaceful smile. Govinda looked steadily in his face with anxiety, with longing. Suffering, continual seeking and continual failure were written in his look. Siddhartha saw it and smiled. Bent near to me, he whispered in Govinda's ear. Come still nearer, quite close. Kiss me on the forehead, Govinda. Although surprised, Govinda was compelled by a great love and presentiment to obey him. He leaned close to him and touched his forehead with his lips. As he did this, something wonderful happened to him. While he was still dwelling on Siddhartha's strange words, while he strove in vain to dispel the conception of time, to imagine nirvana and samsara as one, while even a certain contempt for his friend's words conflicted with a tremendous love and esteem for him, this happened to him. He no longer saw the face of his friend Siddhartha. Instead, he saw other faces, many faces, a long series, a continuous stream of faces, hundreds, thousands, which all came and disappeared, and yet all seemed to be there at the same time, which all continually changed and renewed themselves, and which were yet all Siddhartha. He saw the face of a fish, of a carp, with tremendous painfully open mouth, a dying fish with deemed eyes. He saw the face of a newly born child, red and full of wrinkles, ready to cry. He saw the face of a murderer, saw him plunge a knife into the body of a man. At the same moment he saw this criminal kneeling down, bound 
and his head cut off by an executioner. He saw the naked bodies of men and women in the postures and transports of passionate love. He saw corpses stretched out, still, cold, empty. He saw the heads of animals, boars, crocodiles, elephants, oxen, birds. He saw Krishna and Agni. He saw all these forms and faces in a thousand relationships to each other, all helping each other, loving, hating and destroying each other and become newly born. Each one was mortal, a passionate, painful example of all that is transitory. Yet none of them died, they only changed, were always reborn, continually, had a new face, only time stood between one face and another. And all these forms and faces rested flowed, reproduced, swam past and merged into each other and over them all there was continually something thin, unreal and yet existing, stretched across like thin glass or ice, like a transparent skin, shell form or mask of water and this mask was Siddhartha's smiling face which Govinda touched with his lips at that moment. And Govinda saw that this mask like smile, this smile of unity over the flowing forms, this smile of simultaneousness over the thousands of births and deaths, this smile of Siddhartha was exactly the same as the calm, delicate, impenetrable, perhaps gracious, perhaps mocking, wise, thousandfold smile of Gautama, the Buddha, as he had perceived it with awe a hundred times. It was in such a manner Govinda knew that the perfect one smiled. No longer knowing whether time existed, whether this uncovering had lasted a second or a hundred years, whether there was a Siddhartha or a Gautama, a self and others, wounded deeply by a divine arrow which gave him pleasure, deeply enchanted and exalted, Govinda stood yet a while bending over Siddhartha's peaceful face which he had just kissed, which had just been the stage of all present and future forms. His countenance was unchanged after the mirror of the thousandfold forms had disappeared from the surface. He smiled peacefully and gently, perhaps very mockingly, exactly as the illustrious one had smiled. Govinda bowed low. Uncontrollable tears trickled down his old face. He was overwhelmed by a feeling of great love, of the most humble veneration. He bowed low right down to the ground in front of the man sitting there motionless, whose smile reminded him of everything that he had ever loved in his life, of everything that had ever been of value and holy in his life.